Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Wednesday, March 24th, 2010, and we're sure glad to have you here. Our special guest tonight is Bill Kist, author of The Socially Networked Classroom. Welcome, Bill. Thanks, Steve. Really delighted to have you here. Love the book. I'm going to do a short little intro. Futureofeducation.com is sponsored by my employer, Illuminate, and my day job is to help run LearnCentral.org, a free social network for educators that has Illuminate baked in. We sure hope that you find it helpful and useful. You can run free professional development seminars in Learn Central using Illuminate, so that should be an enticement. I hope you'll come in and, and look around. Coming up on Conversations.net and FutureofEducation.com, uh, tomorrow, Math Demos with a Positive Impact as part of the Merlot series. Next week, Ken Robinson is on. We're all excited about that. Then on March 31st, the Education for Digital World 2.0 book series starts. This is a new book coming out, uh, and we're going through several of the chapters with uh, actual in the trenches educators talking about what they do with Web 2.0. Also on March 31st, another Merlot session. April 1st, Merlot again on with Carl Blythe in the Texas Language Tech. This is brilliant what they're doing there. If I'm remembering correctly, the older year students actually create the recorded material for the first year students. Uh, just a wonderful uh, concept uh, there in that language program. April 6th, uh, Tony Wagner on the Global Achievement Gap. April 13th, Scott Rosenberg, then Larry Ferlazzo, Tim Magner coming on to talk about the proper role of government in education. Should be exciting. Dr. Robert Epstein is going to come on and talk about Teen 2.0. And Bill, I don't know if you've read this book, but man, you have some similar ideas. Have you read anything from him? I have not. Okay, you're gonna. You should Google this right now. I will. It's a, it's a tome, and uh, he's a, a fascinating guy. And your section on adolescence and his are uh, on the exact same page. Randy Orwin on the 27th of April, intelligent implementation of open source software as part of our NSBA TLN series. Jackie Gerstein comes on April also talking about user generated education as part of a beginning series on students 2.0. Leonard Wax. Charles Fidel on school architecture. The Think Global School folks come on on May 13th. This is the international school that's starting up. Michael Furtick on taking IT global. Then Kathy Davidson and still much, much more um, coming up. So we're sure glad to have you here and hope you'll consider joining us for a future event. If you've missed an event, all of the recordings are up at futureofeducation.com. Uh, lots of fun things, including a fascinating discussion last week with Michael Moe about the commercial side of ed tech. We didn't have much of a crowd that night, but if you listen to that recording, please email me because I thought it was just critical uh, understanding um, how large educational uh, firms approach the education market. Also, uh, Trilling and Fidel on 21st Century Skills, a great session. Benoit St. Andre on open social school districts, much, much more, including uh, recent uh, discussions with Clay Shirky, Dan Pink, James Paul G., and, and many others. If this is your first time in Illuminate, this is a collaborative, participative environment. We hope that you will participate. One way in which you can do so are the small emoticons at the bottom of the participant window. Hi, I'm clapping for our guest tonight. You can do the same. You can click on a smiley face, a confused look, or a thumbs down. The larger button to the left with a hand and a green up arrow is how you would raise your hand if you'd like to say something. So uh, we'll save that probably for the Q&A. But uh, that does mean that you're interested in taking the microphone. So if you think you're going to do that, do go up to Tools, Audio, run the Audio Setup Wizard. You can put information in the chat. You can talk to each other. I haven't been reading the chat as I've been doing this, but I'll try and go back through it. Um, do know that even though there's the ability to send a private chat message to another person, the moderators see all of those. And with a group of this size, and we're, it looks like we're about 60. The best way to view that chat is to go up to View Layouts and click on the Wide Layout option. I think you'll have a better experience following the chat. It gives you a little bit more room. OK, so I'm going to give you your first chance to participate here. To the left of the map, you should see a wand with a red star at the end. Click on that, and then click on the map. And let us know where you're listening from. The other thing you can do is you can shout out in the chat where you are, maybe what time and temperature it is. Wow, someone from Australia. Two people from Australia. Hawaii, there's Davila. What time is, is it? What I time is it say. in Australia, I wonder? 
So not bad time if you're able to participate in the day in Australia. We do have an Australia series at learncentral.org, several events taking place in Australia-friendly times. So thanks, Australia, for contributing. Okay, I'm going to move us forward here. Sure glad to have everybody here tonight or this morning, Australia folks. So Bill, um, would you introduce yourself, uh, give a little bit of your background um, before we kind of launch into a quick discussion of the book and then you can go to your slides? Absolutely. Uh, I still, you know, uh, introduce myself as a teacher. I believe uh, I've never gotten away from that. Uh, I started out as a middle school English teacher and uh, uh, became a high school English teacher. Then I was a curriculum consultant uh, uh, for a few years in the central office of a couple school districts. And, um, you know, it was during the time uh, in the 90s when uh, standardized testing was coming on strong and I really felt torn between uh, some of my background in the classroom and uh, what was uh, what I was having to uh, preach as a curriculum consultant so I escaped to uh, the wonderful world of higher ed and uh, have been in teacher ed now for 10 years uh, but I still am in schools constantly and um, I came at this actually uh, I always uh, tell people I'm not a techie. I um, I didn't even own a computer until 1996. Uh, I really got into this because I was a videographer and did some filmmaking with my students uh, again in the early 90s before the internet uh, came in. And I just, uh, as I started working on my PhD, um, ended up uh, uh, really involved in this whole uh, line of research that some people call uh, new literacies, um, uh, other people call multi-literacies. There are many different names for it. And um, and so I, I've really seen my mission as uh, for the last 15 years is to really kind of document uh, the work that teachers are doing across the world. Um, I really think we're at a very um, you know, new era, I, I always, the other uh, analogy I use is the silent film era. I think, uh, I, I feel like we're in that early day, in those early days of, of new media and I'm trying to capture how teachers are struggling with this, um, especially in an era that um, is still very heavy, at least in the United States, with um, standardized curriculum. So in the book, you call your, you actually say that you're a researcher, a reporter, a participant, and even an oral historian. So I, I found that was a pretty interesting description. And uh, do you feel like that's uh, a, an important role to be playing right now? Well, I do. I think I see it as as ful you know fulfilling really two kind of um, objectives. Uh, first of all, for people who are currently teaching and really would like to incorporate and, and try some of these things. I, I think, you know, I was I was inspired um, by um, some of the seminal works, you know, like the famous New London Group article. But, you know, when I got done reading the New London Group piece, I think I was struck by the thinking, uh, the thought, you know, I want to do this but I have no idea um, how to begin. And so I think my work is fulfilling the purpose of maybe showing teachers there are other teachers who are able to incorporate new media at whatever level. But then I also think another um, objective of my work is, is really uh, to act as a historian uh, and maybe someday 50, 60, 70 years from now or, or longer if uh, my books are still in the library, you know, people will be able to look at them and, and see how teachers were um, trying these things at the very, very beginning of the uh, internet and all the other new media. That's very funny if, if, if your book will be in the library. That's reflective of the paradigm of those of us who are, you know, at whatever age where the book might not be in the library because, of <laughs> course, your book will electronically be available. Well, that's true. Hey, um, I do want to give you a chance to get into the slides. At the same time, I thought we, if it's okay with you, could we take a couple minutes and just talk about the organization of the book? Oh yeah, and I'm not I'm not wedded to the slides, Steve. I'll I'll take your lead on this. 
Well, good, and you know better how you like to go through the slides. So I'll just do a couple of minutes, and then we can let you kind of drive it. I was interested, the book was not what I expected, because you organize it by level of available technology. Do you want to talk a little bit about that organizational scheme? Well, I think, uh, again, going back to the um, the New London Group and some of those seminal pieces, I think, and, and I'm glad that we have those pieces and, and people doing that kind of, you know, theoretical work. But I think um, in the, quote, real world, unquote, um, teachers are really, really struggling with um, issues of access and, um, you know, just uh, the amount of technology, that not only the amount of what technology they have available, but, you know, the rules and regulations that they have um, in whatever school district um, uh, they're in. And so I came up with the idea of why don't we do, you know, um, these different chapters so that people maybe aren't, don't feel quite so intimidated. Um, the interesting thing I found in my research is that even young people are intimidated. Um, I, I think the whole concept of the digital native is, uh, I think it's somewhat flawed in the sense that I have 19, 20 year olds in my class that are, you know, will come up to me and say, uh, you know, I'm not into all this technology, you know, um, and so it's not only older people, I think it's younger people, for whatever reason, um, I think that uh, people come at this in different ways. And so I, I hope that my book could show that no matter where you're coming from, there are ideas for you uh, that you can try out in your classroom tomorrow. I had to keep reminding myself reading the book that you actually teach college level. I do. So. Uh, in part, what you're doing in the book is not just gathering the information about the kinds of activities that help to build learning communities in the classroom, but you're also in many ways kind of showing a methodology for helping teachers learn themselves about this material. Yeah, I think so. And that's, I think, the key part of chapter two, um, which is the um, the chapter that begins the kind of levels of of the book, and I tell my own story um, after I came back from the research for my first book, you know, where I went uh, up to see the amazing Clarence Fisher. I don't know if you've had him as a guest on this show, um, but you know, and I, I went out to Los Angeles and saw Marco Torres, um, and I got back to my classroom at Kent State and realized that uh, I didn't have, I didn't even have a website. Um, and so, uh, and then I also, you know, being a curriculum consultant and being a, uh, uh, being a uh, presenter, I had, a, I had collected different activities, hands-on activities that I had done with teachers and, and uh, kids. And I suddenly realized that a lot of these hands-on activities um, really um, had a lot of applications to new media. And so that's, that's why, yeah, I mean, I, I teach at the college level, um, but I did feel it was important for me to talk about my own journey and, you know, um, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. So as a guy who cares a lot about social networking or educational networking. I, of course, loved the title, but I kept kind of struggling as I read the book. Is this new media? Is it social networking? And I actually came to the conclusion that what you were really talking about, and please correct me, but I'll put it out there, that what you were really talking about was learning communities. And that that phrase maybe isn't as enticing as the socially networked classrooms or, or the like. But that even those initial exercises in chapter two are just about creating an a learning community environment. It, it, am I even close to uh, to something valuable there for you? Oh no, I think you're absolutely right on. You know, my editor, um, and I think she may be in the audience today, Carol Collins. Um, she was at Teachers College Press, 
and I did my first book with her, and uh, which is New Literacies in Action. Um, Still in print, by the way. And um, she went to Corwin Press a couple years ago, and she's the one who said, you know, Bill, I really would love to see you do something with, um, you know, Web 2.0. I'd, I'd love to see you do a book that takes uh, new literacies into that um, era of, into the era of social networks. And I think you're absolutely right that, um, when I was putting together these levels uh, and I was thinking about, you know, the um, technologically barren classroom, if you will, and I was thinking about how some of these hands-on activities like the snowball activity or even something as simple as list group label um, can mimic or not, not exactly mimic, but they are um, community builders. Um, I've got some theater, old theater games in the chapter two, you know, that are used by actors uh, to develop kind of an ensemble feeling in their work. So yeah, I, I think absolutely right. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's the old, um, it's the old cliche. It's not about the tools, you know, and I, I, I do think that this book demonstrates that you know, you can do these things with a lot of these things with just pencil and paper. Now, I want to hasten to say, I don't think that should be used as an excuse uh, by teachers to stop there, because I do think that, um, I really do think that we're doing our kids a disservice, especially if you're considering the fact that not all kids are digital natives. I really think you're really doing your kids a disservice if you are just stopping with pencil and paper. Well, I will tell you that the book really helped uh, tie some knots or uh, put pieces of the puzzle together for me that, I, that I'm that i not sure I had fully understood or been able to verbalize. And I, I really loved that chapter too because you know all of those activities were non-technology related or right. electronic technology related and yet they really got at the heart of what I think is so valuable about the kinds of ways we're thinking about education that are being facilitated by the technologies. Absolutely. I think you stated it very, very well. And I think, you know, some I think the chapter two is really ironically the heart of the book. And it's the one that, you know, again is has so um has so little uh, um, technology, you know. Um, but I think it is, um, you know, and, and some of those things that I, I use in the book or have been around since the 60s and 70s, you know, which makes one think that, you know, maybe some of these master teachers were, uh, were you know, doing some of these things for years before they had the internet, obviously. Well, I made notes as I was reading because I hold some workshops for teachers on Web 2.0, and I will definitely use some of those activities as a way of helping them to just get a sense That's of great. Just the so value. Go ahead, Bill. I interrupted. Did I lose you? So I'm not hearing uh, Bill. I, I lost your audio. And I lost yours, unfortunately. Um, if I couldn't hear what you said the last, uh, uh, say, 30 seconds. If you can hear Bill, will you give a green check? Because I'm not hearing him, and I don't know if that's my end or his. OK, I'm back. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I dropped. So Bill, we're losing your audio, and I can see that you're having uh, connection difficulty. I get a little indicator next to your name. So hello, you're, hello, hello, you're, hello, hello. You're going to come back. Don't worry, you'll come back. It'll take just a second. Okay, you should be back pretty quickly. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? I can definitely hear you. Okay. Oh, you're back. There's actually a little indicator here in Illuminate that shows me your connection had lagged. And I huh. think you're you're back on real time. Okay. So um, it felt like there were a couple of big stories in the book. One was when the student asked you if the reading portfolios could be put online. Was that a big moment? 
Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you can see that I talk about stumbling at that at that moment. Here I am, you know, this new literacies researcher, and she stumped me because I started thinking of all immediately. You know, I'm so conditioned that I start thinking of all the reasons why I shouldn't do that or why we can't do it. And the more I thought about it, um, at least to my credit, I did think about it twice. And I said, you know, to the class, you know, maybe we could start putting these, um, you know, online. There's really, uh, you know, no way, no reason why we can't. And yes, absolutely, that was that was a big, big moment for me. So you also talk um, in the book about, um, where there's a quote from a student who says, we were always in classes together, but but never really were a community until now. Was that another kind of aha moment? Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think that's such an important part of, of um, teaching and learning, building that community. Um, I, yeah, you know, I, I've um, heard of research, and I, I hate to quote this because I've lost the the site, but um, there is research. Maybe someone out there can help me find this, but I know that I read several years ago that um, someone did an, a very depressing piece of research uh, that showed that kids had been in uh, school together maybe for seven, eight, nine years, or even 12 or 13 years, and the percentage of the other kids' names they knew was very low. They really only knew um, just a few kids' names. And um, so I think, um, you know, it's, it's kind of sad when I, you know, when I heard that student say that in a way that, I mean, shouldn't that be the way it is in all classrooms? But, you know, when you stop and think about a traditional transmission model, you know, where the teacher is uh, lecturing and to a bunch of passive students, I mean, how would they get to know each other? It would be pretty easy to find some clips from movies that, that use that as a kind of a gimmick. You know, we've been in classes together for five years and I'm the shy guy and you don't even know who I am. Yeah. Right, so, and, it, and you talk in the book about, I think, how there are certain movies that kind of give us a sense of um, uh, that adolescence is a time when we're not quite sure if there should be independence or there should be safety. Do you, do you remember those? You, I think you mentioned yeah. um, a couple. I think that's I think that's in chapter one, and I would have liked to have gone more into that because I think um, I'm seeing actually some questions here in our chat uh, tonight that um, you know are dealing with this whole issue of fear and know the fact that um, K-12 schools are really have a heavy custodial function in loco parentis. And so, but you know, these new media really break down a lot of those walls and for a lot of people that's, that's scary. So I think the, t the Teen 2.0 book you're going to find very interesting. And for those of you who weren't in the pre- when hearing us in the in the pre-show chat, I'm going to actually put the link to this book uh, from Amazon in, into the chat. And this is um, Dr. Robert Epstein, who's going to come on, um, I think, in April and talk to us about this. And th the themes are very, very similar. And he does a lot of documenting of how we've changed our, uh, we've actually created this period of adolescence. And in some cultures, there hasn't even been a word for this period of time. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about that, but I'll be brief. And and uh, but I but I do think it was interesting. You almost kind of give the impression that if we look at adolescents or some of the kind of helicopter parenting or over concern or custodial aspects of that age, that there's even an element possibly of selfishness by the adults or the the uh, parents. Well. Um yeah, I mean, whether it's selfishness or whether it's fear, um, I I always hasten to add, though, when I talk about this topic, that I'm not a parent, um, and so I, you know, I can't imagine, you know, what it must be like uh, to be a parent, uh, you know, and obviously you want to protect your kids. Um, 
but um, I just wonder if um, there is some, you know, overreaction in this area, especially when a lot of these um, platforms such as Ning and Wiki, uh, forget Facebook, but I mean, you know, some of these things, other ways of building social networks can be used that are completely password protected. And um, but I, I just think there's a lot of fear um, out there, and um, you know, uh, obviously we realize that we live in a political world, and I think there there are all sorts of different um, ways of looking at why people are so um, afraid, or why many people are so afraid of these new media. Well, so my interview series actually started interviewing uh, open source programmers uh, who, who had been sort of seminal in the creation of software that was really, really important to the to the internet. And the, the interesting theme was that most of them had actually done that, a lot of that work as teenagers outside of traditional structures. And I am the parent of four children, and I can tell you, I do think that we oftentimes um, don't give our students or children the opportunities for responsibility that would come from these learning communities and the actual ability to put into practice real world, real world skills. So I actually, I really liked that section of the book. Uh, it's at the very beginning, and it's also I think in the refill chapter. Yeah. yeah. I I thought chapter two with the introductory exercises and the refill chapter were probably the ones that were the most compelling to me. I, I ended up marking them up a lot. Um, another th another topic in the refill chapter was entertainment and education. And kind of the feeling that you, of guilt that something entertaining would actually be educational. Oh yeah, that's huge, and I found that in my in my research um, for my first book too. I mean, uh, teachers are just completely uh, guilty over this, and I think many times they're labeled uh, by other teachers in the in the school as being the quote, easy teacher, unquote, um, the ones that are not really rigorous, that's another kind of buzzword, rigor. Um, but yet, you know, if you go into the, some of those classrooms, you've got teachers who are doing round robin reading for 50 minutes and having the kids do worksheets. And, and they think that that's being rigorous. Uh, you know, so I think that whole entertainment slash education binary is uh, is definitely a huge um, um, hurdle that many teachers and parents have to have to and kids have to get over. I mean, even the kids, you know, in my first book would um, would sometimes label some of the teachers that I was studying as being easy, but yet the ironic thing is they would go on and on and on about the projects that they were doing in these so-called easy teachers classes, and they were telling me that, you know, they were going home sometimes and working like two or three hours doing a video or doing a website, you know, um, so if that's not rigor, you know, I don't know what is. So Lorna makes a joke in here. Somebody asked, how could I do all of these interviews and everything with four children? And, and Lorna says, Mrs. Hargadon. So I'm going to give appropriate appreciation to my wife. At the same time, I will say that uh, part of what's fun about these act interviews is that I've been able to take a number of them. And we do a family night every month. Monday night with our family, and we'll do this as kind of a family activity. And Bill, several of the activities in your book I plan to do with my family. Oh, that's great! Well, that's that's uh, very uh, that's a huge compliment. I'm glad to hear that. Let me know how they work out. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be great. Okay, so I really broke my promise to you of letting you get into the slideshow. So if we were to take uh, about the next 20 minutes before active Q and A. Uh, are there is there a particular part of the slideshow or a way to get into it that would be comfortable for that amount of time? Sure. I mean, I I'll I'll just launch into it, and uh, but I'm I'm not wedded to it, um, so please interrupt at any time, Steve. And I, again, I don't know if you want me to respond also to just let me know when you want me to just interrupt me anytime, basically. 
Okay, and if and those of you who are listening, if you've put a question in the chat and I haven't seen it because I've been so involved here, please post it again or raise your hand and we'll be glad to have you ask it. So Bill, go ahead and control the slides if you'd like there. You can go to the next, there you go. There's all my uh, information. I welcome emails. Yes, I still do use the old school email. I am on Twitter also. Um, but uh, please feel free to email me any questions about this. I think you know I often just start by pointing out that we don't really even have a name for some of this. Um, there are many different theoretical frameworks that have um, looked at what we're talking about. Um, and um, I think uh, you know what I am suggesting is that you know you might um, Type into uh, the chat box. You know what Web 2.0 means means to you. Yes, I'm at William Kist on Twitter. I should have put that in the. Um, and I'm seeing some answers: interaction, user-generated contact, participatory, um, open. Uh, you know, and, and again, coming back to what, um, uh, boy, I'm seeing pop up here in my email that a whole bunch of people are now following me on Twitter. That's awesome. Uh, but, you know, as, T, as Steve pointed out in the opening uh, questions, you know, some of these same characteristics that you're typing in to the uh, chat room, you could have in a, a completely technologically barren classroom, too. My uh, research over the last really 12 or 15 years has been trying to find what are some characteristics of these new literacies classrooms. And um, I believe that um, you need to see daily uh, work in uh, multiple forms of representation. I think there need to be um, explicit discussions of these different symbol systems and even what are called think alouds where the teacher models um, working through um, you, you know building a website or or doing something and I guess we don't really build websites anymore do we but you know uh, how do you collaborate with a um, you know building a text in a wiki you know doing if the teacher can model that I think using think alouds I think that's an important characteristic I do think I, I've I believe there should be a mix of individual and collaborative activities. Um, and I, I'm a big fan of Csikszentmihalyi's concept of flow. I think when you're in these classrooms, you really do see that kids are engaged. I believe that you know the, these kind of classrooms resemble then what are called in the literacy field reader-writer workshops. It's just that we're expanding that beyond print um, to include all sorts of different kinds of texts. So basically my study over these last 12, 15 years has been to collect examples of these assignments. And I also follow my former students as they start their teaching careers. And I have two books out on this subject, as um, Steve has been nice enough to mention. Um, I'm afraid, you know, this is the depressing part of my PowerPoint. You know, uh, what does literacy mean in school today? Well, when I get into schools all over the North America, you know, I still see um, all sorts of you know room setups like this, and teachers assigning uh, worksheets. And um, when I ask teachers why are you teaching this way, they'll say, "Well, I have to teach this way to prepare kids for all the testing." Is that's an answer I often get. But the irony of that, or the disconnect of that, is that when you look at typical test questions, they bear absolutely no resemblance to these kinds of worksheets. So if you look at this worksheet, it's basically just asking the kid to, you know, regurgitate, you know, a very fact level questioning um, or fact level uh, facts from the book. But when you look at a typical standardized test question, um, you're, they give you like a little text like this, and then um, you get multiple choice um, questions that uh, relate to that first text. So I think what happens is literacy at school becomes a lot of decoding, round-robin reading. Writing has always been de-emphasized, even going back to the Committee of Ten. And so what happens, I think, in a lot of 
cases is the kids, it just becomes a big game. Let's go out and get the Cliff Notes or sparknotes.com and do whatever we have to do to get an A. I think I'm going to skip through. Well, I just do want to say here that, you know, what's sad is that this is really, uh, forget new media, this is also turning off kids to books and has been for a long time. If you look at the things that little kids say about books, it's quite different from what the things the older kids say about books. And of course, we continue to have a huge gender gap in the literacy field. But what does literacy mean outside of school? Well, we all know, you know, that many kids are doing all sorts of interesting uh, literacy activities outside of school. And we know, you know, uh, thank goodness for the Pew Internet group and all the fantastic research they're doing, um, you know, on how wired we're all becoming. I also point out that um, I think there are some interesting media examples going on right now. I'm fascinated with uh, this program Lost um, that's in its final season in the, in the U.S. right now. Um, and if you look at a lot of these uh, television shows, they really have, um, you know, tons of support materials, including, you know, even the Lostpedia. And I, after uh, last night's episode, uh, which ran here for the first time in the U.S., I'm definitely going to have to go on to Lostpedia so I can understand what was happening. Um, this quote shows that um, a show that's as serialized as Lost would have had a much harder time pre-iPod, pre-DVD, pre-streaming video. So I think it kind of shoots down again that that commonly accepted um, idea on the part of so many people that media is dumbing down our culture and that it, it's um, it's it's waste. It's a waste of time. But while at the same time. Um, uh, there are kids, you know, outside of um, school who are engaging with new media. We still have, you know, in the U.S., a huge uh, level of child poverty. And we have kids that are involved with all sorts of um, things that, um, you know, may inhibit their ability to participate. And I talked about this earlier. I don't believe we automatically can assume that people born after 1989, say, are comfortable with new media. So we, we do have a digital divide, even if it is not nece necessarily due to poverty. Um, and these are some quotes that I've taken from my 18, 19, 20-year-old students. I'm sick of sitting in front of a computer. I can't even remember my password for all the blogs, wikis, and things I belong to. I'm not computer savvy. I'm so glad this course isn't about technology. So again, I'm problematizing Prensky's digital native immigrant binary. And, and Steve, maybe you can get Mark Prensky on sometime. Maybe we could debate because uh, uh, I really have never met him. I, I you know, certainly um, admire you know the dialogue that he's engendered, but I, I just really don't agree with his his main premise. When I taught um, in the early uh, '90s, I used a lot of media in my classroom, but it was all to support a printed page-based text. But now I think post-new literacies, we have page-based texts. Absolutely, we still have them. Um, but we also have screen-based texts that have embedded in them film, music, graphic design, photography, visual art, and for the first time, advertising. So all these things, I think, if we're being fair to our kids, really need to be brought into um, the classroom. But I still think, you know, the paradigm that I have set up in my book is you're still looking at a very old kind of paradigm for teaching and learning. That is, you do some things before reading and writing, and I should put reading and writing in quotes, some things during, and um, some things after. So again, going back to my characteristics, I think, you know, you should have daily work in all these forms, explicit discussions of the merits of using certain symbol systems, uh, think alouds or meta dialogues. And an example of starting off um, is I think 
teachers from a very you know who are working with even young kids should start having them turn in text with uh, hyperlinks embedded in them. If you've ever had the uh, chance to write something that's going to be in an online environment, it's a completely different um, skill. I hate that word, but it's a it takes let's say a, a different skill set than writing for a page based text. So shouldn't we be having kids have that uh, experience in school? And so just having them take a very dry text um, like I have here about the American Civil War um, and just have the kids embed you know X number of hypertexts as a homework assignment. Also I think you know and all these by the way all these um, Assignments are described in my book, complete with rubrics, and and to help you know, because I know you know the first question, a lot of questions um, I get, you know, when I do workshops around the country, is um, I see we've got a hand raised, is you know, how am I going to grade this? Okay, now Steve, how do I? Um, so that was me raising my I, hand. Okay, and it's because Deb Boatwright says stop, <laughs> and Deb's a uh, Pretty regular listener, so I thought this would be a good chance for someone to actually ask a question. Deb, did you want to, to take the mic and go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll let you take the mic if you want to ask that question. Not doing so. That's fine. I'm. I'm. There we go. Okay, I'm going to give Deb the mic. Go ahead, Deb. Good evening. Quick question. You caught my attention. Well, you've got my attention, but you extra caught my attention with writing with hyperlinks. Um, would you have a person do that in Word? What what would that look like, say, in a fourth grade classroom? Well, I def the way I have done it with kids um, is, um, yeah, I start them in Word because I think that's, that's what most people use. Um, even, I think, uh, to build um, you know, a text that eventually will be online. Yeah, I start them in Word and I just take them through the steps of, you know, highlighting a word and then inserting the hyperlink and, and making it into a hyperlink. And then eventually, you know, we can um, either copy and paste it into a wiki or a Ning. But yeah, I start them in Word. Does that answer your question, Deb? She says, "Love that idea." So I guess so. Um, yes, very. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a foundational. I think it's a foundational. Again, I hate the word skill, but um, and ironically, you know, in the United States right now, we are dealing with uh, what's looking like uh, is going to be a national curriculum, and there's nothing about you know creating. Uh, a hyperlink, uh, a text embedded with hyperlinks in there. Um, so there's my there's my editorial comment for the evening. Um, going on, then you can do anything using these hyperlinks. Uh, have kids do a learning log about a, a book they're reading. Oh, I've another hand's raised. Okay, I got to go up and see whose hand that is. I'm not seeing it, but I know, Durf, did you want to take the mic? I've given you the mic if you want it. Okay. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. No question then? I don't think so. Okay. Um, just finishing up the PowerPoint here. Um, you know, obviously we have many people, um, you know, uh, such as Don Liu at the University of Connecticut who have come up with all sorts of different ways of helping kids read websites. Um, I like to have kids collect images that match vocabulary words. Um, again, going back to my characteristics, I think you know we have a mix of individual and collaborative activities and flow. Um, I'm just going to launch into then you know some of the ways that you can use a blog. Uh, they can be used to house. And you know what I've noticed um, is that um, there are a lot of similarities, really. I think be in the way that teachers are using blogs, wikis, and things. Um, but starting with blogs, they can be used just to house student projects that are that are completed. Um, they can be used to house prompts. Um, they can be used to house um, class notes, activities, or a video stream. As our our one of our esteemed guests, uh, Bill Chamberlain, uh, has a fantastic uh, 
website uh, that is uh, well, not a website but a blog that where he hosts his um, streaming video of his classroom. Housing research writing, um, keeping a learning log. Um, you know, for people who are um, uh, worried about you know security issues. Um, I think that um, you know setting up intranets and there are a whole bunch of different uh, systems that there's Bill Chamberlain just uh, just uh, posted his um, his uh, site website. Thanks, Bill. Twenty one classes I know is being used by a first grade uh, teacher that I'm working with uh, here in Ohio. Think Quest and even Turnitin, which is famous for plagiarism, catching plagiarism, can can be used as a as an internet and as a way of hosting blogs. And essentially, these teachers are built are housing their um, classroom websites. Yes, I'm from Ohio. I'm at Kent State in Ohio. Karen, so are you from Ohio? Okay, moving right along. Uh, in my book, you know, again, teachers have to. Um, but Karen's from Cincinnati. That's awesome. Anyway, we all have to figure out a way. You and I do at the college level of uh, slapping a grade on things. And uh, but even apart from that, obviously, we want to have a way of assessing kids' participation. So in my book, you know, I have a whole different way, a uh, bunch of different ways that teachers have done this and are doing this, including myself. One thing you can also do if you don't want to have your kids blog themselves, and I can't imagine why you wouldn't, um, but you can have them follow topical blogs. And Clarence Fisher is actually the one um, that I learned this from up way up north in Snow Lake, Manitoba. Moving along to wikis, I think we many of you know here how to do that. Um, but again, you'll see some of the same functions, whether it's hosting study guides, hosting literature circles, hosting class activities, simulations, teacher resources. And again, there are uh, uh, ways of evaluating participation in this. Nings, um, I have found that uh, at the college level, I'm not getting the participation in the class Nings that I set up as much as I am in blogs and wikis. And I don't understand why that is. But I do know that um, many K-12 teachers are using it kind of as a Facebook substitute. Um, it can be used for role playing, debating a topic, um, housing again, housing things such as a syllabus or a response repository. It could end up being just a teacher faculty lounge. And in my field of English language arts, obviously two famous Nings are the NCTE Ning and the English Companion Ning. And by the way, could I give a plug? Um, NCTE is attempting to do a virtual conference here um, in the uh, in the next uh, month or so, if you just log on to ncte.org, it, um, it um, is right on their front page. And I'm one of the presenters. Um, Bud Hunt will be presenting. And um, you know, I think some of these uh, old school organizations, such as NCTE, which is coming up on its 100th anniversary, are um, you know, attempting to really get involved with new media. And I think that's a great thing. And then Jim Burke has created um, uh, an English companion thing that's very fast growing that functions again as kind of a uh, faculty lounge. There are there are a few teachers um, who are beginning to use Facebook at school. I think the most common um, example I'm seeing of it, however, is still having kids do it outside of school, setting up study groups. But there are occasionally um, there's a teacher that I'm working with. Um, in Wisconsin, Mike Slowinski at West De Pere High School, uh, who is has gotten permission from his administrators and and board to use Facebook in the classroom. We have a hand raised. So that's me again, Bill. So I really love how the book kind of gives a rationale for um, even considering Facebook because of the ability to to help build a learning community. So uh, I'm just going to try and tie this discussion back to especially chapter two of the book and just the descriptions of how engaged the learners become when they feel like they're part of a community. And it seems to me that would actually be an argument for looking at Facebook. While I don't like Facebook's 
discussion capabilities and much prefer the name, it does seem like that ties directly to your sense of uh, understanding of what kind of engagement can happen in a learning community. Well, absolutely, and um, you know that's not to say that you don't want to build community face to face um, as well. Um, but um, I think you know a reason for using Facebook. I agree, it may not it really have a great discussion function, but when it's got, I think it just passed its 600 millionth user. Um, I may have that number wrong, but I mean it's rapidly becoming. Um, a key way that human beings do communicate. So again, just coming back to if that's what's so ironic about people that want to keep it out of schools, you know, shouldn't we be talking with kids about the difference between a personal and a professional Facebook account? And that's what this uh, Mr. Slowinski does in Wisconsin. He has students set up a professional. Facebook account and they have discussions about what does it mean to be professional in a social network versus personal. And I wish someone had told me that before I got on Facebook because I've got all my personal friends uh, mixed in with my professional friends and um, that's okay. Um, but um, anyway, um, he's got a whole bunch of different protocols. Um, Students should use avatars instead of uh, I've seen other hand raise. So this is Deb again, and I'm, I'm going to give her the mic. I think she's asking how you would separate your personal and professional, but Deb, go ahead. Yes, that's with hindsight. Do differently. What would I do differently was the question. I missed a little bit of her audio. Yes, she meant with hindsight now, what would you have done differently with Facebook? You know, I go back and forth on that because I I like actually in some if you're asking me personally, um, I know that you can uh, set up Facebook so that if I wanted to give out a very professional announcement of some kind, I could limit it to certain people. But um, I actually kind of am enjoying the mix of I have old high school friends on there. Um, I have several. Um, Former students, um, you know, and in a way, it's kind of fun to to unite that personal and professional. Um, but I, I do see the need for you know, if you're doing this with kids, to talk about um, you know uh, the difference between you know what you would do in a professional uh, Facebook profile versus a personal one and. You know, one um, barrier to doing this right off the bat is that you need to have two different uh, email addresses to set up two different accounts in Facebook. So that's a problem right off the bat. But it is something that can be overcome. And the benefit is this teacher has gone on to set up writing groups and um, lit circles in Facebook. My students have interacted with his high school students. And I think we're going to end up writing maybe even a book about this. And I just have a slide that kind of shows how you would set up the, the groups within Facebook. You can see that he did um, uh, literature circles around different uh, YA lit books, such as Tangerine and The Absolutely True Diary of Part-Time Indian. Bill, um, someone who logged in as Edu Innovation asks, do educators today have a responsibility to be involved in social media? Does this fake make them a more effective teacher? That's a question that that's an excellent question that comes up all the time. And you know, the problem with our field is and I I don't know that we really are able to come to agreement on what makes for an effective teacher. I mean, I think we all know it a, a great teacher when we uh, when we see it, um, when we see a great teaching going on, although I think we can all think back on our own experiences at school and maybe there was a teacher who was not seen as effective, but yet maybe you found that teacher to be effective. Um, all that um, is kind of a di digression before answering um, your question. I mean, yes, I do believe that um, teachers, uh, if if we're looking at a typical day, 
of most human beings, most human beings are reading and writing a great number of minutes a day on and off a screen. Um, no matter what job they're having, and forget jobs, um, just a quality of life issue. I mean, if we then as teachers are not incorporating that into the school day, I just think that we are really um, doing a disservice to our students. So yes, I think that teachers should be involved in social media themselves, even just if you just you know subscribe to just some blogs. Um, you know uh, that's you know one of the main points of my book is that you can start very very simply. Still, I think see huge benefits for your kids. So, Bill, I'm wondering if it, it would be an oversimplification, but it occurs to me that you could teach writing very well with a pencil and paper and with a typewriter, but teaching writing with uh, the computer and new media is so, is so substantially um, different now that maybe there's a comparison. Which is, you're saying it just you know teaching reading and writing with a pencil and paper is doesn't mean you're not going to be a good writing teacher. But it's hard to imagine being as effective in our culture and society right now doing so. Yeah, I just think that I know that there are many. I because I, you know, again, I get into lots of schools um, around the country, and you know, I always have people come up to me and say, "Well, you know, Mr. Jones down the hall, he, you know, doesn't have a cell phone. He doesn't." Uh, he doesn't do email, and he's a master teacher that I would love my kids to have. Um, and that's fine. I, you know, um, I just think that Mr. Jones is cheating his kids, really, uh, out of um, a whole world that they are going to be thrust into. And I'm not just always. I'm not because everybody always talks about the world of work. You know, I'm not just talking about the world of work. I'm just talking about just. So, you know, socially, um, entertainment-wise, uh, you name it. I mean, if um, you know, I read books. I mean, we all. I mean, I think most educated people we read books. We love books. Um, but I just think if we're limiting our kids to page-based texts all day long, day in day out, um, we are really cheating them. So we're getting to the end here. We've got one minute to go. Bill, I'm going to clap for you. I know we didn't get through your slides, but I, I really want to recommend the book. Um, this is a terrific book, The Socially Networked Classroom. Um, and I particularly love chapters two and chapter six. Uh, and you do give some latitude for people reading around in the book. So hopefully they'll they'll jump in where there's interest and then and then from there to other parts of the material. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Steve. Uh, great interview, and I really enjoyed being a part of this. I'm going to move us to our last slides. Uh, appreciation to Illuminate and Learn Central for keeping me employed. Thanks to Charlene Bloom and Associates for providing me with a book budget uh, to allow me to buy books. Um, and and um, many thanks to them for their support in this way. And they're also supporting EduBloggerCon coming up uh, Saturday, June 26th the day before the ISTE show. And for those of you who are interested in open source, of course, Open Source Con, our very first unconference for K-12 open source that same day, also in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and another plug for school20.com. Um, Jackie Gerstein, I, Jenny Luke, and some others are, are hoping to build a network for students who are looking for mentorship and help outside of their traditional learning environment in social media and uh, entrepreneurship. Um, if uh, you are interested in more fun events, please look at our schedule of upcoming events. Uh, next week, a lot of fun with Sir Ken Robinson. I think we're all looking forward to that. Jackie, yes, School 2.0 is going to rock. So thanks again, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Bill. I'm clapping for you again. You will receive everybody when you depart the room. A survey will pop up in your web browser. Please fill it out and let us know how you felt about tonight. And um, I will stick on for 15 or 20 minutes for post-show talk. But Bill, you've done your duty, and we will understand completely if you take off. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm willing to stick around for a few minutes if that would be uh, of interest to people. Great. So that allows us to do a little bit of Q&A that we weren't. If you need to leave, don't feel badly. 
uh, just, just exit out of the program, close your window or go up to file and exit. But if you'd like to stay and ask Bill a question, I'm going to give uh, everybody mic capability. What I'll do is I'll change the number of mics that can be alive at one point in time. But feel free to grab the mic and ask a question if you'd like to ask uh, Bill a question. So Bill Richards asking, are you collaborating with Rick Furtig on anything? You know, I don't know. Can you remind me uh, who that is? I'm I'm drawing a blank. Oh, he's someone at Kent State. Well, I will have to um, I will have to to find him and uh, and introduce myself. I think I've lost my audio. Okay, now we're hearing you. So Sal, go ahead to turn your microphone on. You click on the larger microphone button in the audio area. The mic on, you've raised your hand. There you go. There you go. Okay. Hi. I thank you for tonight. I really enjoyed your session. I have a question. Do you have any uh, form to give to parents uh, for permission to do all this different type of social networking? That was, that was a general. general. I do. I do, I do actually, actually, and not to keep plugging my book, but um, there are several examples of forms uh, in the back of the book. Yeah, and I see Bud the teacher, if you uh, go on his uh, website, um, he has them too, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so this is a time when you can ask a question. Please feel free to take the mic. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you, Bill, a little bit more. You talked about the op the, the potential that schools, I mean, sort of a Larry Cuban concept, that schools could take the authentic and turn it into the inauthentic. Are you actually seeing that anywhere? Well, yeah. I mean, that's um, I am seeing that, and um, it's kind of difficult in the sense that you know I really respect. So many of the teachers, um, you know, that are trying these things, but occasionally I do get a little bit worried when I see examples that look to me a little bit like online worksheets or almost kind of online. Um, I don't know. They're very controlling or almost intrusive into monitoring student work. One of the books that I assign my undergrads is a Little Brother by Cory Doctorow, which is a fiction uh, piece. Um, it's just brilliant showing what could happen in a kind of 1984 parallel uh, schools today. And I think you know, it's, it is a little bit worrisome to me that, um, and one of the main themes of both of my books is that we have to be careful that we don't just um, co-opt these new forms to serve old purposes. One of the other questions that occurred to me was, um, what about the student who is really not technology interested or oriented? Guy or gal who is going to become a glass blower or a car mechanic. Um, what what do we need to do to assure that they're still having um, a worthwhile well, I think that's that is really um, a good question, and I do think I mean uh, I really believe in offering students choice, and that's what's so um, scary I think about a national curriculum. Uh, I saw someone on here said, well, they've they've dealt okay with um, um, national curriculum, and that's that's great, um, but I think. Um, a reader writer workshop type of approach, you know, allows for a glass blower or a visual artist or what have you to try out all sorts of different media. So we're in post show chat. If you have a quick bill has been uh, nice enough to stick around. If you have any questions for him, please feel free to put them in the chat area to grab the microphone, which you do by clicking on microphone button in the audio area and just go ahead and ask a question. I see that Jenny is uh, asking a question about distance learning. Um, yeah, I think certainly 
in higher ed, distance learning is really um, hot. Um, in my book, I profile um, profile a school in Minnesota, that a high school that's actually attempting to do some uh, hybrid courses where the kids are actually staying home and doing work at home. I think again, it's very brave, but uh, I think distance learning, you know, all this stuff I think is, I think, eventually going to transform you know, the, way school, the way schools look, the way they're, they're set up. Um, I know that so many, uh, so many colleges and universities are certainly scrambling to get on board with that because uh, obviously we don't have the issues of um, go parentis. Bill, your audio's coming in and out for me. It may be that your mic has moved a little, or you can increase the volume on your microphone using the slider. Bar. Okay. Hello. Yep. Hey, would you talk a little bit about that blended um, blended learning example you give in the book? Yeah, it's a school in uh, Minneapolis, um, and they have decided to do this as a school where they have set up the schedule in such a way that um, kids uh, can, I don't know how they do it just from a logistical standpoint. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, but um, you know they have kids that are staying home during first period, like two days a week, and then they come in for face-to-face -face class three days a week. Um, and so far, they've had no problems. And in the book, I talk about um, I give examples of how they set this up and how they communicated with parents um, to set to set it up. And so far, it's been successful for them. So William asks, the William who's quoted extensively in your book, he's interested in audio literacy. Can audio literacy take some of the pressure off the reading literacies for our low readers? Well, I suppose it all comes back to what, how do we define literacy? Um, it's interesting you bring up audio literacy. You may have noticed I don't talk too much about podcasts in my book because um, of all the new media, I, I think I've been most worried about the applications of podcasts because it seems to me that quite frequently they just end up being um, kids reading aloud some, you know, book report um, and, um, you know, uh, I just think, um, yes, audio literacy, I think, is very important. If you um, email me, Bill, I can um, email you some, um, I don't have it with me right off the bat, but the Shakespeare Folger Library has done some really neat um, modules to help kids learn, um, like the Foley that's used in uh, filmmaking and um, you know, helping kids create sound effects. Um, of course, they all they're coming back to a Shakespeare play, but at least I think they're maybe getting at a little bit of what you might mean with audio literacy. And you know, in fact, Bill, uh, I did a session with PBS on with the Shakespeare, the Folger Library, and it should be in the recordings um, on Classroom 2.0 or at uh, futureofeducation.com. So, uh, William, Bill. The other, Bill, if you don't have a link for that, please feel free to email me and I'll send that along as well. So Jackie Gerstein, I think you would really uh, love the, the, the parts of the book on adolescence and um, the, the custodial aspects of school. And, uh, you know, we didn't spend too much time on that, Bill, but it sure seems like that's, um, I was surprised to find that message two days in a row, having just talked to Robert Epstein the day before. Are many people talking about this sort of um, societal construct of adolescence that, that didn't exist before historically? No. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't see it. And, you know, uh, speaking as a professor, you know, I'm actually occasionally having grad students' parents contact me. I mean, we're talking about people who are going for master's degrees who are having their mother or father call me um, 
And so, you know, I just think we this is something that would never have happened a hundred years ago. And don't get me wrong, I, I don't think uh you know, we need to we want to go back to a time when we had kids working in factories, but um I think we definitely have um we definitely have a, a different concept of adolescence now and I think it's it's definitely playing into some of the barriers and obstacles that many teachers have when they want to try some of these things. So this is a to me it's a fascinating topic of discussion and it's one I think that's particularly difficult because a lot of it comes out of perceived authentic desires to help children. So the kind of helicopter parent that you and others describe, I mean, you're not the only one telling those stories, remind me a lot of just the, you know, I will talk with my own family about, you know, at what age do you let kids kind of wander the neighborhood alone? At what age did we wander the neighborhood? And, and even people that I love and respect will say, I totally get that, but for my child, I'm not going to let them do it. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I, it's very difficult for me to really comment on this, I think, um, because I'm not a parent. And so it's very easy for me to to make these grand pronouncements. Um, but um, I do think that, you know, just coming at this just from a postmodern perspective, I mean, if you really look at childhood, the way we construct childhood, uh, adolescence, it is a social construct. Well, and we're having some good, you know, questions in the chat. You know, a good parent lets go. Others say, no, a good parent does not let go. Uh, all I can say is that I, I've talked to my dad about this on many occasions, and he, they had sort of free uh, roaming rights in the neighborhood when he was growing up. You know, he grew up in Philadelphia, in, a, in Ardmore, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. They would, you know, wander around, and it was it was not just that he wandered. You know, his parents weren't weren't constantly responsible for him, but there was a different economic structure at the time, and I think affluence, a general sense of general affluence, not individual affluence, but general affluence has played into this. But there was also a sense, my dad would say, that the neighbors would correct him, and I would no sooner correct my neighbor's child now than than you know write myself an invitation to court because it just feels as though you know the society is very different. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's not only an economic um, construct. I think, you know, again, I'm going to stray into armchair uh, psychology, but I think there are adults that are, well, let's say there are some adults, I feel, just again, being a, an observer of working with kids now for, you know, over 20 years, who seem to be living very much vicariously through their children. I know I'm not the first person to suggest this, but you know, maybe back a hundred years ago, adults were just concerned with surviving and uh, uh, they um, really weren't interested in going to every soccer game or advising every Cub Scout activity. Uh, they were just too busy getting through the day. So your audio is cutting in and out just a little. Again, if you want to just raise that mic volume, it sometimes drops down. Okay. I think you're absolutely right. And I, you know, I remember my own childhood. And, you know, it, it was a rarity that my parents actually came to a soccer game. But I know others my age, their parents came to every game. And I, so I think it's hard to make blanket statements about those experiences or whether or not they're good, because there can be very positive aspects to being actively involved. Like for me, I always try and coach my kids' soccer games teams because it's a way of spending time with them. And yet at the same time, I feel a little oppressed by the fall soccer Saturdays because I feel like I have no time at home to do chores. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the other, you know, concept that's been written about the hurried child, you know, the overbooked child who, you know, has something every night of the week and so the parents are chauffeuring them and uh, I just think that some of these constructs spill over into the way we're viewing literacy and, and media at school. Fascinating. Well, I really enjoyed that part of the book and as I recall it's both in the, in the, the beginning section and then also in that uh, refill chapter um, that you talk about then. 
and uh, and we'll hope that we'll stay in contact on that. Absolutely. Uh, and on other things, I hope. So I think it's about time to wrap up. Really appreciate your sticking on, Bill. Thanks to those of you who've been around. I, uh, I'm going to invite you. I'm actually going to invite you to finish up because we'll clear out the room and in order for the recording to process, the room has to clear. So I'm clapping one more time. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Bill. Great job. Really appreciate your coming on the show. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you.